okay sir thank you for kind words it's like actually one of the latest entry of armamentarium in the clinical practice and possibly which is going to change the way we are looking at reproductive endocrinology in the next 3 uh, to 4 decades so this is what uh, amh the anti mullerian hormone which actually was a mullerian inhibiting substance but uh, to see further i start with one of the favorite mythological picture this was the image of lord krishna when mother scolded that you are eating all mark and all those things he just opened his mouth and then showed that look at inside i am not eating anything but the mother could see the entire stuff there and possibly the entire world there and amh is actually possibly figuring into that that you are trying to see lot of things through amh now with a simple blood test i will cover the amh under the following headings few slides about the physiology both males and females the amh role as of now in reproductive endocrinology and pediatric endocrinology reproductive there is lot many lot many papers lot much issues but pediatric is where it requires more focus some of the recent advances and the clinical issues when we look at amh in the practice it started with identifying something known as amh from the sertoli cell which basically inhibits the mullerian structure so that is where it started with that a simple role simple factor that you require a hormone or a factor at that point of time which inhibits the mullerian structures because the primordial tubercle can go into either way as a female or a male sexual organs so this is where it started that you require amh which inhibited that people thought that that is the end of the story and this had no role till the amh was discovered from ovarian tissue also that granulosa cells do produce amh and the amh was responsible acts like a gatekeeper of the follicular development it inhibits the follicular activation and possibly inhibition of the granulosa cell growth and inhibits aromatase so amh levels were described in females as well that it is not only restricted to males you have some role in females as well looking at the levels of amh in both males and females this is a comparative chart if you see the amh in males it goes up to almost 1000 picomoles in the initial days and then comes back to somewhat respectable or comparable levels between males and females in females the production starts from the 36 weeks of gestation and then peaks till about 20 25 years and then gradually declines till about 45 50 and thereafter they reach a plateau so this is the general comparison the only importance being the amh in males in the newborn or in that period are much much more elevated or rather in comparison to a female level so that's important to know definitely the role is different at that point of time so as i said the expanding horizons of amh initially was only restricted or thought to be restricted only for the uh, divert uh, demarcating the gender to male but later on ovarian follicular growth came into existence and ovarian reserve assessment and multiple benefits and some of the papers about recent advances i will talk about the hypothalamic amh receptors the gnrh priming and what exactly the pcos how we look at it from the amh perspective there lot many studies are coming up in this now so i shall spend few slides there this is a amh incidentally was discovered in 1947 when india got independence and <clears throat> initial days you see the number of publications of amh 1984 the amh was produced by adult ovary was described thereafter also did not increase much but definitely when compared with the initial maybe 2 3 decades thereafter you had better uh, increase in the number of papers but the moment 2002 the documentation that amh correlated with ovarian reserve then started the explosion of amh now you can see the graph it's like a corona second wave it's going up 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 
and the amount of papers from uh, regarding amh and ovarian assessment there plenty now there plenty so we shall spend some time in the amh in reproductive endocrinology now ovarian reserve estimate we have an esteemed panel of a gynecologist and a radiologist with us i am sure they know that uh, the ovarian reserve was not a easy thing to estimate or easy thing to lay hands to express especially uh, educate the female about her fertility potential and all those things we used to do day 3 fsh maybe more than 10 indicates a reduced reserve and all these hormones have to be done during the follicular phase they have so much variation you cannot get them as per your will and all those issues existed whenever you wanted to do actual ovarian reserve estimate antral follicle measurement was considered one of the gold standard even possibly when amh came into existence issue again remains it's a subjective you require a good operator who is experienced there is lot of inter operator variability with this measurement so all these things did not have a very classical uh, full proof way of estimating a ovarian reserve then came the amh a simple biochemical test most robust and most importantly no cyclical variation one of the paper which said about the amh levels throughout the menstrual cycle right from minus 14 to plus 14 you can see the variation with the standard deviation it's so beautifully lies in a single line that any time of the menstrual cycle you can actually pick up and then do a test which will give you the status of possibly the ovarian functional reserve so that is what is the advantage of this test the amh is maximum secreted from the preantral follicles you can see the amh secretion rises as the antral development happens and the maximum number of amh uh, production is from the small antral follicles and correlate with directly with the antral follicular number so as your antral follicular count reduces your amh levels red reduces and almost by about 40 45 years you have a uh, no amh level or possibly a very minimal amh level because they correlate with the ovarian reserve that has been extrapolated to most of the other places where ovarian functional insufficiency has been described so it is a marker of premature ovarian insufficiency can predict the transient and permanent state because the amh level will tell you the ovarian reserve and it will give you that is it likely to be a permanent one or is it a transient one because of some other extraneous factors post chemotherapy or radiotherapy especially in uh, young cancers for some where you are using a chemotherapy or possibly radiotherapy you can look at amh levels before and after therapy and possibly modify your oncotherapy which has limited effects on ovary the vincristin bleomycin and methotrexate are less ovary toxic than when compared with cyclophosphamide and melphalan so it's important to choose your chemotherapy depending on the malignancy which may have less effect on the ovaries which can be marked or measured using amh coming to amh in pcos again the pcom you are going to listen to this in the next talk also the polycystic ovarian morphology is one of the criteria to diagnose pcos so again a diagnostic marker which is operator dependent more cumbersome you have to count the number of follicles and more than this number more than this size present in both ovarian volume there are lot of issues which you need to calculate so by and large the amh is going to it is not yet come into as a diagnostic marker but amh more than 5 definitely correlates with hyperandrogenism and possibly will circumvent doing this count of the follicles in the ovaries this is more easy to do and important thing if you can look at this in the picture the ultrasound picks up these antral follicles whereas the amh is getting all these early antral follicles also which smaller ones when they start producing the 
image that all will get captured in the CRMI image level. So that's important to know that the ultrasound may not be giving you a clue to the PCO morphology, which AMH is going to give. So AMH, many number of papers are coming, are, I mean, pushing that AMH to be included as one of the diagnostic markers for PCOS. Ovulatory dysfunction, the PCOS falls into type 2, the common ones. The type 1 ovulatory dysfunction is a hypogonadotropic central one, whereas type 2 is again hypogonadotropic, normoestrogenic, and type 3 is hypergonadotropic, that is ovarian failure. The AMH is elevated in type 2, low in type 3, and in the central one, it can be either normal, low, elevated. So not much of differentiation as far as type 1 ovulatory dysfunction, but type 2 and 3, you can easily make out based on the AMH levels. Coming to fertility potential, because it's a marker of ovarian function, it predicts the probability of conception and possibly may serve as a fertility test. There are times to come where you may have to have a AMH level, which is going to decide that what are your chances or what are your percentage wise, better prospects, all those things. The other important thing is in especially the ART practice, we are more worried about the ovarian hyperstimulation. So based on the basal AMH level, you can modify the dose of FSH to prevent the OHSS. So possibly if somebody has got a AMH baseline of less than one, maybe you require a higher dose. If somebody has got a AMH of more than three, you are more prepared to see OHSS and you will reduce your FSH accordingly. So it's like this gives you a clue as to how you practice your assisted reproduction and the dosages of the drugs in the clinical practice, which was not there earlier. After this, the AMH as a predictor of menopause is important because of a uh, most of the I mean ladies get pregnant now in late twenties or mid thirties. So, and any of the ladies with PCOS have more chances of a late menopause. So it's like you AMH will give you a predictor of menopause, and there are some nomograms developed where at the AMH centile levels, how much or you can actually predict that you are likely to have a menopause, natural menopause at so-and-so age. And this will help the patient better prepare the family, better prepare the menopausal event and better prepare for the, if there are any issues concerning menopause or early menopause, we can use the hormone replacement adequately at that in a given patient. So again, a clue to the forecasting the menopause, which is one of the definitive event in a lady. So many issues about pediatric endocrinology has come up in the last decade or maybe one and a half decades using AMH. Basically, AMH indicates the presence of a testicular tissue whenever there is a doubt in disorders of sexual differentiation. Now, issue is if suppose in a uh, child of 46 XX DSD, virilization is there in females. If AMH is grossly elevated, you can safely assume that it is a dysgenetic testis, there is a testicular tissue inside. Whereas in CAH, the, all the androgens come from adrenal and AMH is going to be normal. So that is one of the key factors. The, another important differentiation which was not there earlier is between CDGP and IHH. Uh, the endocrinologist would get connected more with this. There is a constitutional delay and idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Technically, there is nothing which differentiates between the two. Only observation till 18 years will differentiate. But because of some actions of AMH in the GNRH migration, GNRH neuron development, in idiopathic hypo hypo, the AMH levels are low, whereas they are normal in CDGP. AMH will help you in tracking whether you have removed the over testis completely, assessment of testicular dysfunction in Klinefelter syndrome. So there's a lot of new, I mean, uh, what do you call uh, research is coming up about use of AMH in DSDs. 
uh, to make the life more easy i have picked up this from the paper what i have quoted in a 46 xy dsd if testosterone and amh are both less than the normal age related males then what is expected to be it is definitely there is a gonadal dysgenesis which is indicates that there is a whole testicular dysfunction testosterone alone is deficient whereas amh is normal obviously the problem is with the leydig cells because that is the one who produce the testosterone so either there can be lh receptor or leydig cell hypoplasia all those defects can be there testosterone is normal but amh is not there it's a sertoli cell specific defect which classically translates as pmds which is also known as persistent mullerian duct syndrome both testo and amh are normal it's like a simple androgen insensitivity syndrome or phi alpha reductase deficiency so the in a 46 xy dsd the levels of testo and amh can give you the clues to where you need to further identify the same goes with 46 xx dsd if testo is more than what is expected as a female and amh is like uh, akin to a female range it's due to a cah that's because testo is coming from the adrenal tissue the testo is in the male range and amh is in the male range so definitely there is a testicular dsd germ cell specific dysfunction either over testicular or testicular dsd testis testosterone less than male but more than female and amh also less than male or more than levels akin to seen in a female it's again a over testicular dsd so these patterns of hormonal values will tell you to narrow your differential diagnosis in dsds and help you in further work up in pmds the biggest cause is either amh gene mutation or a amh binds to amh2 receptor and then further gets on to amh1 which is transmembranal and then acts so is it due to a amh gene or amh receptor gene mutation if it's undetectable amh with normal inhibin it's a gene mutation but if you have a normal amh and undetectable inhibin it's like a amh receptor gene mutation so based on simple blood test and clinical feature you can possibly without doing the genetic analysis identify where is the problem pubertal disorders some of the papers have got i mean some uh, fluctuation or some i would say inconsistent data about uh, classically categorizing them with any particular etiology but there are some which have said that to differentiate between premature thalarche and central precocity amh does help but again these are only in say 20 to 40 sample size and not much repetition so i shall not uh, speak much about this but working work more is going there coming to recent advances this is where actually most interesting aspects of uh, amh coming into play till now we thought that we have uh, pcos you have follicular arrest because of follicular arrest there is more amh whereas some of the people have started looking the reverse because of more amh that it is leading to follicular arrest and they have done it through culturing the granulosa tissue outside in vitro and then looked at the transcriptional activity of amh and said that these cells are destined to produce more amh because of increased amh there is a follicular arrest so it's which is the cause which is the effect so it is coming into play more differentially the second important thing is presence of documentation of amh on the gnrh neurons which we all know that there is increased pulsatility of gnrh there is increased pulse that means more lh comes into play lh fsh ratio was used as diagnostic mark of a pcos long ago but the issue is is it what is the response what is the reason behind now people are blaming amh as one of the reason because of documentation of amh receptor even in the hypothalamus in the gnrh neurons pcos mothers have more chances of pcos girl babies in their i mean generational so the issue is again amh is being blamed why look at uh, this this is one of the neuroendocrine development issues 
amh increases the gnrh neuron activity and gnrh release and the more the rapidity of the pulse the more alh comes into play the peripheral actions are the same there is no difference so a paper published about few weeks back in cellular and molecular life sciences so amh role in the migration of gnrh that is where if you remember the cdgp versus ihh the ihh actually there is gnrh migratory defect so you have low amh so there is lot of uh, new exciting area of development neuroendocrine issues using amh as one of the markers this is the transgenerational programming of uh, due to amh there is increased amh levels in the mothers who had pcos this amh inhibits the placental aromatase and increases the androgen levels circulating these increasing androgens actually reprogram the gnrh neuronal network in fetal brain so they have more again increased pulsatility of lh and increased chances of developing pcos all because of possibly amh so lot of issues about those and so much so that people have started developing amh analogs in the reproductive medicine you have agonists also you have antagonists also agonists can be used again like for amh you can delay the on onset of menopause fertility preservation because you are arresting the follicles you can use it along with the chemotherapy agents you don't want the follicle to be any arrested follicle is less uh, exposed to damage rather than a growing follicle something like that and antagonists can be used to get away the block which is induced and can be used for ovulation induction so these are also more amount of research is going on in this aspect elevated markedly elevated amh levels are seen in hypothyrosis and granulosa cell tumors of ovary any markedly elevated amh please 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 look for ovarian tumors especially granulosa cell tumor and it works as a beautiful tumor marker correlates with tumor size predicts the recurrence predicts leftovers and the predicts the recurrence of tumor the biochemically it starts going up before you actually get a positive pet scan so it's important to know and success of ovarian uh, transplantation in fertility preservation whenever we are using amh in clinical practice we should know some things which affect them the value per se elevated pcos is known but vitamin d deficiency there are some papers about vitamin d and uh, amh levels vitamin d deficiency per se increases the amh by about 20% same there is a seasonal variation the summer months there is a increase about 20% in the same given individuals i am talking about and there are some papers which have said about the racial variation chinese have the highest whereas when compared with the caucasians and blacks suppress the only obesity ocp usage and the brca1 brca2 mutation carriers they have less amh level than when compared with the normal counterparts so in nutshell amh in clinical practice definitely there is no doubt about it being a robust marker of a ovarian reserve there is no doubt about it there is enough uh, data and that is uh, indisputable probably pcos is next on cards where it is going to be established as a diagnostic marker fertility a lot of centers are using amh level based uh, protocols menopausal prediction may not be that relevant here but yes it does play a role so it is going to come in the uh, clinical practice soon puberty dsd differentiation and tumors less but yes it is possible by virtue of its again uh, mechanism of action and its production futuristic possibility of using amh analogs as per our need based in reproductive endocrinology time is yet to come for this but work is going on in that direction the professor alfred jost was the first one who described the presence of a male factor that there is something which is required for the gonads to develop into males and this was the paper which described it in 1947 and the current world authority as far as amh is concerned is professor natali joso who was a student of professor jost both from paris and she is the one who has 
n number of uh, i mean identifying the amh gene amh receptor gene pmds all those subsets of work concerning amh so she is a pediatric endocrinologist who is in paris so my tribute to these people who worked and in the last three decades made amh a household practice name in the reproductive endocrinology field i have finished here